So without further ado, I will um, ask our first speaker on this first panel, uh, Dr. Matthew Wilkinson, who's from our Centre of Islamic Studies, who will talk about our way of being British, a philosophical basis for Muslim integration. Can I welcome Matthew, please? Greetings of peace, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Uh, it's my privilege to start moving the conversation forward by talking on the subject, our way of being British, a philosophical basis for authentic Muslim integration. So my session offers an imminent critique of assimilationist and multicultural models of Muslim integration and after I've made the diagnosis, I go forward to the prognosis, which is a preliminary suggestion of how the philosophy of what I call Islamic critical realism might underlabor the authentic integration of Muslims with British society. So just a little bit to tell you about where I come from. Uh, I started my thinking life as an Anglican theologian. Uh, I then embraced Islam and became a Muslim Islamic studies and history teacher. Uh, I am now still a Muslim, a philosopher of Islam in multi-faith societies. Uh, I'm also director of the research program Curriculum for Cohesion, which is now proudly based at the Centre of Islamic Studies, SOAS. Uh, and our research program examines the relationship between Islam and Muslims and the institutions and ideas that underpin multi-faith societies. So for my critique, political ideology has tended to oscillate between assimilationist and multiculturalist models of integration. The right has tended to favour assimilation and the left multiculturalism. Both are inadequate models for authentic Muslim integration. Assimilationism unfairly privileges dominant secular, cultural, ethical and usually a-religious norms. It assumes that normative Islamic beliefs and behaviours are deficient when compared with a liberal secularising worldview with its attendant values, assumptions and behaviours. By contrast, multiculturalist models homeostasize Islamic cultures as fixed and belonging to an ancestral homeland, when in fact cultures of all types, including Islamic and British ones, are necessarily porous and mutually transformative. Both these models are damaging to the ability of Muslims, especially to the young, to relate authentically and productively to British life, since they locate Islam qua faith as essentially belonging elsewhere. Neither models takes account of the fact that the Muslim community is primarily a faith community, and that any model of Muslim integration needs to be appropriate to the ontologies of faith. By contrast, a satisfactory model of Muslim integration would need to mobilize the intellectual, spiritual, and cultural tools of the Islamic faith. And it would need to reflect the fact that for many Muslims, especially third generation young British Muslims, to enact our faith is our way of being British. That is to say, Britain, warts and all, has provided us with the opportunity to be more completely and dynamically Muslim. So within our Islamic community of faith, we already have some ready-made tools, um, Islamic tools, to help us in the necessary prophetic task of relating authentically and productively to our fellow compatriots and citizens. For example, applying the categories of Islamic jurisprudence, law, and the objectives of the maqasid of the sharia, the objectives of law, the, the principles that underlie the law. In the name of assimilation, we can never, for example, make permitted what God has forbidden. We cannot assimilate happily into alcoholic drinking cultures and permissive sexual cultures. However, equally importantly, there's a flip side to this. In the name of multicultural identity politics, we cannot make forbidden what God has permitted. And this includes aesthetic cultures, cultures, cultures that encourage freedom of expression, albeit not, as we've heard, absolute ones, and political democratic cultures. We cannot make these cultures forbidden, either to us or to others. There are other legal categories of, of the recommended and the disliked, 
which can also help us make nuanced choices about the elements of British majority cultures that we can embrace, elements that we need to transform, and elements that we would do best to avoid. Within this conceptual toolbox, I want to focus primarily on contemporary philosophical theology of Islam, which I call Islamic critical realism, and its role in helping develop the type of mindsets of Muslims who can be confident of the realities of faith, even in hostile environments, and yet open to the wisdoms, truths, and learnings of those of other faiths and none. And I take this form to be the basic form of Muhammad and his companions and of the authentically integrated British Muslim. So what is Islamic critical realism? It is a philosophy of Islam which enables Muslims to engage with contemporary modernity, with deep spiritual rationality. It is based on the seminal insights of critical realist philosophy as applied in particular to Islamic praxis. It foregrounds the power of human agency to transform the iniquities of structure. However, it does not demonize structure. Structure, for example, governance, are necessary, Islamic, and potentially good but also prone to hiatus, split, corruption, and negative absence. And these, this, this, uh, this foregrounding of agency is based upon the Quranic principle, God does not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So there are five foundational principles of this systematic uh, philosophical theology of Islamic critical realism, which, by the way, is fully outlined in my book, Fresh Look at Islam in a Multi-Faith World. The first is a meta-theoretical meta commitment to under-laboring. The second is a meta-theoretical commitment to philosophical and religious seriousness. The third is the application of the critical, critical realist nature of the Quranic message in its totality, including the primacy of unity over duality. The, uh, the fourth is an exploration of the critical realist nature of, of the divine message. And the fifth is the fact that the critical realist idea of dialectical change in the conditions of being was exemplified in the life and the person of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the first principle, un underlabouring. The primary purpose of critical realist thought is to underlabour, which means to bring conceptual and philosophical clarity to other intellectual and practical causes by clearing away erroneous and redundant philosophical concepts. This philosophical commitment to, in John Locke's word, clearing the ground away and removing some of the rubbish that lies in the way to knowledge, and to a comprehensive conception of the practices of human flourishing, is precisely shared by Islam and its tradition of theological philosophy, both Kalam and Falsafa. Islamic theological philosophy was traditionally the creative interface between the revelation of the Quran and the injunctions of the Sunnah, and the contemporary novel circumstances in which the Muslim community found itself as it expanded. As such, like the, the edifice of Islamic praxis itself, Islamic philosophical theology has traditionally underlabored the recovery of human well-being through knowledge of God and through enlightened human relationships. Islamic critical realism, likewise, intends to provide an intellectual bridgehead between the post-enlightenment intellectual conditions of modernity and the eternal revealed principles of the Islamic faith. The second foundational principle of this system is what I call seriousness, philosophical seriousness. Islam and critical realist thought are philosophically serious. That is to say, they demand a knowledge practice consistency which is essential to their very nature. Islam in its authentic manifestations is characterized by religious seriousness. That is to say, in Islam, belief and knowledge are inextricably interpenetrated with practice. With practice. For example, the phrase, those who believe are those who believe and do right action, is the most frequently repeated of all Quranic light motif. As Kadiyad of Granada has explained, in this, in this um, partnership, the, the Arabic pronoun wa indicates an intrinsic partnership and not an extrinsic relationship. Islam, authentically understood, is serious religiously because once you've committed to a doctrinal belief, you have also committed to a set of practices. It is the interpenetration of practice and belief in a way that is consistent with one's lived circumstances that generates the human relationship with God. Similarly, critical realism has demanded philosophical seriousness in knowledge, practice, consistency right from its start. Critical realist thinkers, for example, Bhaskar, its founding figure, critiques Hume's denial of the ontology of causal laws and deep natural structures, which had led Hume to state there was no reason why he should not leave a building by the first story window at least 50% of the time. But of course, he never did this. Thus, Hume in actualism and postmodernist derivatives of it extrude thought from the experience of the world and are therefore philosophically unserious. 
Extreme Islamisms do the same. They extrude Islam from the lived conditions of contemporary life. By contrast, the marriage of philosophical and religious seriousness is at the beating heart of Islamic critical realism. The third principle is, is the principle of Islamic critical realism grounded in the core critical realist understanding of reality. Five minutes. Sorry? Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, at the core, um, are grounded in three interrelated principles, ontological realism, epistemological relativism, and judgmental ra rationalism, as applied to the dimension of the spirit. By the principle of ontological realism, that being exists independently of knowing, for example, the sun and the experience of it did not change in a heliocentric or, ge or geocentrically described universe, God can be said or not to exist independently of our knowledge of him. Likewise, unseen spiritual realities, the human divine spirit, can be said to exist independently of our knowledge or belief or lack of it in them. Ontological realism about God does not claim a priori that God exists, although, of course, as a Muslim, I believe he does. Uh, but the fact and the realities of his existence are not dependent on our knowledge and belief in them. Therefore, ontological realism about God makes God talk philosophically plausible and indeed necessary. Relatedly in this, in this discussion, epistemological relativism pertains to the different faith traditions and perspectives within faith traditions that pertain, their, that pertain to and direct their gaze at the realities of faith. In this understanding, all interpretations of the ontology of faith are subject to radical human fallibility and the potential to be wrong, which does not mean that the ontological reality to which they refer to does not exist. In other words, by the, by the principle of epistemolo epistemological relativism, the fact that God has, known, has been known differently does not mean that God does not exist or that the God that exists is different. So the compatibility of these two things, ontological realism and epistemological relativism, necessitate judgmental rationality. There must be and can just be discovered effective ways of choosing or distinguishing between one mode of spiritual access as opposed to another. In Islam, for example, systematic theology, philosophy, contextual exegesis, and understanding of culture uruf, are all the traditional tools of judgmental rationality. Therefore, it is possible with the Islamic critical realist fulcrum to claim both that God has accessed and been accessed through a variety of traditions and to choose one tradition as opposed to another, while still drawing on the insights and, and understandings of other faiths. In the perennialist language, we can allow for the fact that many paths lead to God without thinking that they are all equally effective or truthful routes. Thus, the fulcrum of critical realism can be the critical framework for allowing young people to justify and take confidence from the divine ontology of their faith while accepting the potential fallibility of all interpretive statements about faith and accepting the need to learn from the insights of others, of other faiths and none. How long have I got? You have three minutes. Thank you. So my fourth principle is that the Quran is a critical realist document. This does not, of course, mean that God Almighty was a critical realist. But is it to say that the Quran in its totality presents a critical realist vision of the universe? According to the Quran, the universe and its natural and social structures, including nature, the nations, tribes, and the individual soul, are real. The Quran says we have created the heavens and the earth and everything in between them with truth and reality, knowable being, Bill Huck. The Quran speaks of the stratified ontological stages and emergence of the creation. Yet the reality of these things, existent though they are, can only be apprehended through deep spiritual and intellectual reflexivity and evidenced investigations. Critical rationality is a core quality of authentic Quranic belief. Unthink unthinking belief or blind following is not an Islamic state of mind. Reality existent as it is, described by the Quran, demands not only that we be critical, but also that we be self-critical. Finally, it is credible to make the claim that the mission of the Prophet Muhammad was critically realist. That is to say, he was intellectually critical in the way that he applied Islamic teaching to enable the behavior of enlightened individuals to transform social structures. He was realist in understanding that they should be not be dismantled. One minute if the message of divine unity was to be apprehended and to have enduring appeal. The prosecution of his message was that with the paradigmatic dialectic development described by critical realists in being in history. So the first moment, the moment of distinction, this is the moment of, of non-identity, of distinction. Belief is distinguished from unbelief. Truth is distinguished from fal falsehood. Social welfare is distinguished from social neglect and malpractice. This leads to the second dialectical phase, absence, 
Non identity with tribal beliefs and practices results in an absence of recognition, a loss of social position, and physical pers persecution for the person of the Prophet Muhammad. This absence gener generates radical change in, in the form of the emigration to Yathrib, which becomes Medina, the place of totality, which leads to the third dialectical stage totality, internally related being, where Islam is, is, is enacted in its totality, Mu'amalat and Ibadat, as the totality of relations, and the constitutional brotherhood of all Abrahamic faiths is declared. This leads at the fourth dialectical level to transformative Time up. practice, whereby the whole uh, behaviour of the Arabian Peninsula is changed. If I can just, I will have 20 seconds. Thank you. Thus, the example of Muhammad, thus delineated, can help young Muslims understand that a peaceful engagement with transforming society does not mean being consigned to passivity, persecution, or marginality. Through this model, we can apprehend that it is not an excess of Islamic praxis that has hindered authentic integration, but an absence of Islamic praxis and an excess of Islamic identity that have been the obstacles. So in, in summary, my final slide. Thus, Islamic critical realism applied through education can help young Muslims engage authentically with the multi-faith world by fulfilling the traditional world of, role of philosophical theology. It can be the basis for a Muslim citizen who both retains a critical distance from and is deeply engaged with and belongs to British life. And if you want to read more, can I recommend my book, A Fresh Look at Islam in a Multi-Faith World. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Wilkinson. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Jorgen Nielsen from the University of Copenhagen on how European is the British Muslim experience, a comparative reflection. Please welcome Professor Nielsen. Thank you very much. Um, the University of Copenhagen is, tri is true enough, but it's a bit misleading. I live in Birmingham. Um, it's been very interesting these two days. Uh, if one had listened to all these conversations and contributions uh, just as they stand, uh, one would think that Britain is already out of the EU. Um, I think it's very useful in this kind of conversation to, remember, to, to have a perspective from outside and to have a look at what the situation in Europe likes, but also it looks like, and also, but also comparatively, um, how it compares with Britain. Now, I'm going to be chased up in now nine minutes uh, with a statement that I've got five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to have to squeeze a heck of a lot into a very short time. Um, when I first moved to Copenhagen University in 2007, uh, I was very soon after had a meeting with the British ambassador. And much to my surprise, he told me that they had a staff member who had a watching brief on Danish integration projects, local and national. And I thought, given everything that one says around Europe about the British experience with uh, immigrants and ethnic minorities and religious minorities, um, namely that Britain is way ahead of the rest of Europe, I found it interesting that the British Embassy thought that he could learn something from um, this small country across the North Sea. When we talk about Britain and Europe comparatively, we are very often thrown into, especially from French voices, we're very often thrown into this dichotomy of, uh, of uh, British communitarianism against French individual citizenship. Um, just one example, the French laïcité against the, the British system. Um, the French laïcité is more ideolo ideological than real. Um, we forget that when 1905 religion and state were split in France, um, the state kept possession of the churches, of the Catholic churches. So when Notre Dame, Notre Dame today needs repairs, the state pays for it, a situation which uh, the Church of England must envy, because they have to collect every single penny to do up York Minster. Um, you could also compare, and I've heard it done in Germany quite often, uh, a, 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 a distinction between a Britain which has become increasingly secular, not just in the social sense, but in the legal sense, 
um, through the decisions of courts. Uh, you hear churches and Christians complain about being discriminated against by, the, uh, against by the courts. In fact, my suggestion would be that what's happening in Britain uh, is that through these court cases, the courts are basically following a principle of equality between the religions, which means that you know, on the face of it, it looks as if um, the churches are being cut back, whereas the other um, newer religions are being favored. Um, I suppose in practice it must be a bit like that, but it is the principle of equality. Whereas in most of mainland Europe, um, where the Constitution agrees freedom of religion, um, the Constitutions do not um, guarantee equality of status uh, among the religions. There are enormous dissimilarities across Europe. Um, it gets up my nose when people start talking about Muslims in the West. Yeah, all right. But the moment you start getting any closer than uh, geostationary orbit, um, you very quickly begin to see such differences among European countries that it's very difficult to, to generalize. In Eastern Europe, you have a long tradition due to traditions of political control, you have a long tradition of state recognition of religious communities. Romania had a chief mufti uh, in the communist period, still does. Uh, but in the communist period, he had a monopoly of the um, control over the Muslim community. Of course, it was a means for state control in the Soviet systems. Um, and these muftis in the various Soviet and Soviet satellite countries were almost invariably officers in the local KGB. Um, in Scandinavia, you have national churches with different relations to the state. Uh, if you ask, if you look at Danish statistics, you will find that 80% of the population are members of the Lutheran of the National Lutheran Church. Um, it's a bit of a fraud uh, because. Baptism is a kind of cultural rite of passing, and by baptism you become a member of the church. Uh, you'll be lucky to find 2% in the church on a Sunday. Um, in some countries, there's significant public funding for religions, including increasingly for um, Islamic activities. Belgium, uh, Islam was recognized in 1974. In Austria, an old recognition from 1912 was renewed in 1979. And in both cases, it entailed, although there have been practical difficulties in Belgium, it entailed public funding for um, Islamic religious education in schools. In Belgium, it entails that the public pays the salaries of priests which forces the Muslim community to figure out what is a Muslim priest to be able to uh, get their hands onto that funding. Um, Germany finally accepted towards the, the end of the 1990s that it was a country of immigration. And within 20 years, the Muslim communities in a number of the German states are either close to recognition uh, as a public body in the same status as the churches and the Jewish community, but certainly in a number of states have already gained recognition for the purposes of Islamic religious education in schools, uh, and to service that, the federal government had, has put in five years of seed money into five universities for the development of courses in Islamic theology to train the teachers who have to teach this uh, subject. And uh, again, in Laïciste France, the central government pays the salaries of uh, imams and priests in alsace mosel uh, Alsace-Lorraine, because that had operated under that system after it was conquered by the Germans in 1870, and it was retained when it came back to France after the end of the First World War. Norway and Sweden, there is public funding for Muslim organizations. So we're dealing with a continental system where the variety, in, in many countries, there's a variety of various forms of public funding for recognized religious communities, which does include, uh, very often and increasing numbers, does include 
Muslims. Now, across Europe, there are increasing number of common conditions. And what's driving this? Um, from the outside, from that is outside the Muslim communities, EC policies, European Commission policies, European Union policies, are a major driver. Policies towards harmonization. Um, yes, uh, the status of religion and the relationship between religion and state in the various European Union member countries is under the authority of the state. It is outside the competence of the European Commission in Brussels, but uh, there are constantly regulations and policies being introduced, uh, and have been, um, which indirectly have an impact on the status of religions uh, and thereby also on, uh, on, on the living conditions of Muslims. The most, most well-known one uh, is, I think it's 2000, the directive uh, on, um, on employment uh, and uh, training where uh, discrimination on the basis of, of religion, among other things, was banned. It's taken some years for various countries to introduce that directive into their uh, national legislation, but as it has been introduced in Britain and various other countries, it is impacting quite markedly through court cases uh, on the situation uh, on the ground. International events have driven the uh, discourse and the practice um, quite significantly, ranging from the obvious uh, of Islam going up the um, horizon of attention, starting with the Iranian Revolution and going through events ever since. There was a world between, before 9-11. It's not just 9-11 has changed things. There were a lot of things going on before 9-11 uh, served, in my view, to confirm rather than to start um, new developments. What nobody has talked about either in these two days is the current refugee situation. This is, well, you can thank Cameron and his attitude to the camps in Calais for the fact that this doesn't seem to have impacted much on British domestic discussion. But you don't have to go far, across, far from the channel before you uh, run, run into it head first. Pegida in Germany is being Five strengthened minutes. enormously. Um, the right-wing nationalist parties of Scandinavia are being strengthened. Gerd Wilders is having a whale of a time uh, in the Netherlands because of this perceived, actual perceived threat of hundreds of thousands of, well, Syrians, Afghans, or whatever. They're all Muslim, aren't they? The fact that 10% of the Syrians or more may be Christian is neither here nor there. Uh, they are all Muslim. And it's really skewing the political debate towards the right. There's been a drift towards the right anyway uh, for the last 20 or so years, if not more, but certainly the last 20 years. But this last year, that rightward shift has become distinctly dangerous. And that feeds in then to the, 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 the driver of securitization. The security debate and security measures taken by European governments are harmonized in practice uh, through Brussels. And <clears throat> we have got to the position where across Europe, I think one has to accept that the only way legitimately to be a Muslim in Europe is to be a pacifist Muslim. A contradiction in terms not only for Muslims, but also for most Christians, with possibly the exception of Quakers. There are drivers internally from within the Muslim community. The Muslim communities came first, when they arrived in Western Europe, as ethnic communities, as national communities. They came as Algerians, Kashmiris, Pashtuns, Bangladeshis, uh, et, et cetera, et Turks, etc., Kurds, and so on and so forth. But increasingly, with the passage of time and the passage of generations, they have become, are becoming um, Muslims. There is a shared Islamic identity developing across Europe, 
which is replacing, or is it becoming? It is replacing the ethnic identities of the past, or is it becoming a new ethnic identity? And this shared Islamic identity across Europe um, is beginning to show impacts uh, of a harmonizing nature. Um, it is the same agendas, the same pressures, the same objectives that active, that, that active Muslims are um, working for in, a, in very, various Muslim countries. And in doing so, in the last 10 years, we're beginning to see growing networks of Muslim cooperation across European borders. Now, that's new. Um, 30 years ago, Muslim political activism took place in the local authority areas, because that's where you had to go to get the immediate benefits. Uh, gradually, it, expand, it expanded to the national level, and the increased membership of Muslims, of, of participation of Muslims in national politics, representation in parliaments, and so on. Now, it's going transnational. Uh, within the European communities, especially encouraged by Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty, which requires that the uh, European Union establish a, a kind, some kind of regular relationship with the religious communities, and not only the churches, the religious communities of Europe. Finally, I would suggest that we are, we are seeing a merging of Eastern Europe with Western Europe, not just politically, a merging of outlooks. In Eastern Europe, we had a long history of uh, authoritarian, um, reg uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, variously fascist, then after the Second World War, communist. Uh, and there's a sense across, for example, the Balkans that um, the old national rivalries had been uh, subsumed into the uh, shared dictatorship of the proletariat. In Western Europe, after the Second World War, there's a sense that after many decades, generations of religious and national contest, we had finally figured out and become comfortable with what it meant being French or Dutch or Danish or German. The last 30 years, that has been upset, since 1990 especially. Time up. The, um, the national rivalries of the Balkans resurfaced. They had not been subsumed by something in common. Uh, the growth of multicultural populations through immigration in Western Europe meant that the comfort of what we thought was our national identity had been upset. And suddenly on both sides of Europe, on both sides of what used to be the Iron Curtain, um, issues of citizenship, religion, national identity, participation, etc., etc., were now open to question again. I took part in a seminar in the European Parliament in the 1990s. One of the parties had discovered that Muslims are also voters, so they had a day seminar on uh, Muslims in Europe and the various. Um, parties from the various countries that invited Muslim representatives to take part. And it was lovely to see, for example, all these Turkish participants from France and from Germany, from the Netherlands and from Britain, all greeting each other like long lost brothers. Once the Professor Nielsen, started, can I ask you to wrap up, please? Pardon? The time's up. Could you possibly wrap yeah, up, please? Thank um, you. 20 seconds. Yeah, 20 is fine. <laughs> um, it was lovely to see them greet each other like long lost friends. The moment the discussion started, the German, German Turks wanted concepts clarified. The French, Muslim, the French Turks um, philosophized. The British Turks um, asked whether it works. So within one generation, um, I would dare to suggest they had actually become integrated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is Arkil Ahmed, the head of BBC Religion and Ethics, and, and, a man, so, and a man who has to grapple with the reality of our theory and how to apply it to something concrete on screen. So please give a warm welcome to Arkil Ahmed. I thought I was last. I hadn't planned. Um, well, 
I feel like a bit of a fraud here today, because actually I'm a professor, but I'm a professor of media, and professors of media just talk rubbish, um, but not in a non-academic way. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to speak about integration, but from integration from a point of view of not, not so much the things that you would have heard, and I'm really sorry that I've not been here for the past two days, so I don't actually really know what, if I'm going to be repeating what people have said. But effectively, the thing for me that I want to talk about is, is well, it's about me, really and what I do and what people like me do and, and the problems that we have trying to put integration into practice for a mass audience. So there's something I'm just going to get out of the way at the start and that is I'm not talking about narrow casting. So people who are professional Muslims or who in the world of broadcasting or the media, if they're talking to themselves, if, they make, if, they're, if we're talking about a very narrow, small newspapers, magazines, websites, ch TV channels, etc. That's narrow casting, and there's nothing wrong with narrow casting, but I'm just going to be ignoring that for the time being. And I'm going to talk about broadcasting, which is actually dealing with that wider group of people, people who may not necessarily share your background, your perspectives, your knowledge, or your interests. And that's the world that, sadly, I live in, which makes it very, very hard. So, for the past about 14 or 15 years, I've been involved in the world of religion and ethics. And before that, I was, I was primarily a current affairs producer. And then somebody asked me if, as a, as a young executive producer in the BBC current, News and Current Affairs, uh, they, they, I was asked to um, be uh, exec, executive produce a season on Islam. And this was going to be the BBC's first ever season on Islam. Uh, and if any of you can remember it, are old enough to remember it about 14 or so years ago, um, it was, you know, it had the first ever documentary on the Hajj, and we had everything from a Jules Holland special on music through to the history of Islam, etc., etc. And um, it was great. I dedicated 11 months of my life to that. I thought I'd done something fantastic, and I then went back to current affairs, and then about three or four days later, 9-11 happened. And so I'd, the whole world changed. And the whole world changed that day for people, even in the world of religious broadcasting, because at that point onwards, someone like me suddenly became more important. Uh, simply because in religious broadcasting there hadn't been an, there hadn't really been anything other than say Christian broadcasting, and that's not uh, to be used in any kind of derogatory way. It's simply to say the world we lived in was a world of songs of praise and ethical documentaries. And I ended up working looking after a series called Every Man. If any of you are old enough to remember Every Man, I was you know I looked after Every Man, and this was big flagship documentary kind of output. But we still weren't making programs that may feel relevant. So I looked after every man in a post 9-11 world and we didn't know programs about Islamic terrorism or about et cetera because they didn't, even though we are told by lots of lazy journalists have interviewed me over the years and academics as well and students for their dissertations, et cetera, and they all ask the same question which is the events of 9-11 and 7-7 and the war in Iraq, et cetera, and all those things must have made your job easier because there's more of an interest in religion. And I always come back with the same point, which is, <laughs> you can say this and you can write this, but it's not a reality. And the reality is, at the BBC, and I then went to Channel 4 a couple of years after 9-11, that's why I was the commissioning editor for religion. Um, we, I, the the programmes I inherited at Channel 4, I think two years after 9-11, were programmes, I think the, three, the last three programmes were a programme on two athletes at the Commonwealth Games in Manchester who happened to be Christian, uh, the Joanna Southcott Society, if any of you know what that means, the Joanna Southcott, yeah, there's a few people nodding who you may have watched it because nobody else did. And I think the final film was a film about Ibiza, uh, evangelical clubbers in Ibiza. This is two years. Now, no, this, this, the interesting thing about evangelical clubbers in Ibiza is that's what I call a 12th of... Had that, had that, I met them on the 12th of September, those same people, when I was, when I was looking after everyone. They came to see me on the 12th of September. I'd arranged the meeting, very excited about this idea, and on the 12th of September it seemed like the most ridiculous idea on earth. Uh, at 10th of, 10th of September, they would have got the commission from the BBC. They met somebody at Channel 4 in between that period who thought it was a great idea, but that's how fickle and shallow life can be. You can make a decision based on what's around you. So anyway, so I inherited this kind of world, and we, what we have done is try to understand the world that we live in. So coming from a background of current affairs, coming from a background of history, politics, all the things that I studied, there was a, I felt we had to, there had to be an understanding. We had to understand what was going on. 
uh, and that has involved with using the kind of contacts and knowledge and experience and friendships and incredible great filmmakers and journalists that I know. We then went along and we made programs such as Inside the Mind of the Suicide Bomber, which is the first ever interview with failed Palestinian suicide bombers, The Cult of the Suicide Bomber, you name it. We've had Emmy nominations and all sorts for these particular kind of programs. And culminating in a really interesting piece of research when I was at Channel 4 about seven or eight years ago, which was the audiences started to dip for the cult of the suicide bomber and all those programs. And there you've got two options at that point. One is which to carry on, or you think about why have those audiences dipped. And those audiences, uh, the, the research that came back to me was that, well, they're fascinated now about the mechanics of what's going on. Now they want to know the reality of what's going on with regards to why would somebody want to do this? What is it about? Is there something in their faith? There is a lack of understanding of their faith. And further research told us that the audiences that like programs like history, for the sake of argument, would be interested in religion, but they wanted to understand what religion had to do with the world that we lived in today. Not necessarily the, how it manifested itself in, say, suicide bombing or whatever was the issue 10 years ago, but how it, mani but how it explained that world. And that's why, whether it was regards to Christianity, we did a, a huge series called Christianity, a history, eight-part series on, B on Channel 4, or we did the Quran, which was the first ever film on the Quran in the West, which, if any of you can remember that, you know, went out on Channel 4, a couple of million viewers, which was a huge amount of people at the time, and sold all around the world. Uh, and it, it obviously explained what the, the, the story of the Quran to a non-Muslim audience, and to a Muslim audience, for that matter, as well but also explored what some of the basic issues that people wanted to know about today, such as the role of, 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 of Islam and women, or the role, et cetera, um, uh, of, or the role of con conflict in Islam, what the, what the Quran had to say about any of that. So it had some direct relevance to today. And that's one of the things that I picked up from that kind of knowledge, from that kind of research, which was we can go along making programs for those who know nothing, but I'm uh, uh, sorry, who, 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 to narrow cast, but when you're broadcasting, you're making programs for a whole load of people and you want to integrate that knowledge with people, but you can't force it down, you can't force them to watch a documentary on the Quran, but you can somehow get two million people on Channel 4, which are, just to put it into perspective, that was at a time when Big Brother was getting about three, three and a half million, which is a huge amount for Channel 4. So to get two million people to tune in meant that they were tuning in because it meant something. It was of relevance to them. They wanted, they had a thirst for that particular knowledge. Um, and when I came back to the BBC about six years ago, I made uh, a series which uh, I've been trying to make for about six or seven years, which was on the, on the life of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. And um, if, if any of you caught that, and that was, again, you know, 9 p.m., BBC Two. There's no, there's no, you're not making this for, for Muslims, you're making it for, and actually, quite frankly, Muslims aren't watching any of these programs anyway. That's the biggest thing that I've realized over the years. So you're making it for non-Muslims, and then we get into the whole conversation about how you do that and why, and what is the reason for doing that? Well, it's because it's one of the best stories ever. So this is the first ever series on, on the Prophet. So the first ever program on the Quran, the first ever program on the Prophet, even before that, the first ever program on the Hajj. Uh, if you're really, really old, I did the investigation into corruption in the halal meat trade 25 years ago, which, to my shame, the next day there was creation of the halal food authorities and all those things. So yes, yeah, so that little known secret, big northern bloke here, 25 years ago as a young boy, did a BBC Two documentary on halal meat, and that's why you now have all these people making a fortune out of halal meat, food authorities, etc., which didn't exist at that time. So, but making that program all the way 25 years on to a program to now is that program was made for Asians, stroke Muslims, but mainly for Asians. Now we don't make programs for Asians or Muslims when you're broadcasting. You make it for a wider audience. So you have to integrate the subject matter in for that wider audience, but you're integrating that subject matter for an audience which has zero religious literacy. The people watching The Life of Muhammad on BBC Two, and there's about 1.8 million of them on whatever, whichever, in her first episode on first transmission. Five minutes. That's not 1.8 million people with any knowledge, probably, of the, of the Prophet. I mean, these are figures which, you know, aren't, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't you know, bet, bet, uh, bet your mortgage on, and they're not very scientific. But effectively, 1.8 million people, you're making a program where we're having to explain to them a subject matter 
so that they can understand it and that makes it directly relevant to them. And at times, there'll be people who'll watch these programmes and they'll say, that doesn't mean anything to me. And that's because I go back to that point about integration means something completely different in the world that I'm in, which is, it's my job to do a number of things. And, and uh, this current guys have been the head of religion for the BBC. I say we have three particular things that we have to do. And that's where integration plays a, plays a part. One is, we are to make programmes that reflect the audience and the audience's needs and, for, and the vast majority of the audience would be from a Christian tr perspective, tradition. We have an, Im an important role to play in marking what goes on in the calendar and that could be anything from Easter, Christmas through to Diwali. We have, you know, uh, Jewish New Year or whatever it may be. I think the next film we have going out in that particular uh, area is a film on... Um, uh, Princess Sophia, the, um, the granddaughter of Dilip Singh, I think, who was the grand, grand goddaughter of Queen Victoria and a very famous suffragette, and that will go out uh, in a few weeks on the period of marking the birth of Guru Nanak from the Sikh faith. So we do all of that. But the third tier, and this is the third tier which is very important, which is to play a part in, in reflecting that lack of understanding of religious literacy. And that lack of understanding of religious literacy is the thing that I would like to really leave you all with and something maybe we can explore later on. And that is, religious liter the lack of religious literacy applies to absolutely everybody. You know, I've got loads of great stories about the lack of religious literacy in the industry I work in. I, I, I now, um, I, people think I studied theology because, because effectively I've been working in this field so long and I've made thousands of hours of television and radio, etc., in this field that effectively you kind of end up knowing everything or a little bit about something. Uh, so I know a little bit about everything. But the fact of the matter is we live in a world where people don't and you can be some of the most educated people on earth and you can have zero knowledge about anything. So we talked about, someone talked about Calais just recently. So I went to Calais with the team. It was my stupid idea to send the Songs of Praise guys to Calais and, and we had to have a senior manager on the ground. It was, it was me or my executive producer for uh, Songs of Praise. I can speak a bit of Arabic, he's a scouser. I thought I had more chance of getting through to people on the ground than he did. So I went along, um, as, as was described by a Sun journalist who didn't know who I was, as the Asian Ross Kemp security guard. <laughs> and I, um, yeah, he had no idea what story he had in his hands. He told me to get lost, get me that woman producer over there. I'm not interested in the thoughts of the Asian Ross Kemp security guard. Um, <laughs> I thought, great, if you knew who you were talking to, that would be a bigger story. But, but while we were there, there was an interesting thing about when we talk about that. I, in a, I wrote a blog explaining why we went. And in that blog, we talked about, for our Christian audience, this is really important. Because for our Christian audience, they will understand what migration, what, what asylum means, because of the, in the story of the Holy Family and Christianity, it's an important part, the flight to Egypt, etc. I was ridiculed and vilified in the, in the, on the Express and in some right-wing press and on all the right-wing blogs and websites saying, what's, what's the nativity story? What's, what's the census got to do with migration in Calais? And you think to yourself, are you an idiot? It's not Bethlehem we're talking about. It's when they go to One Egypt. Minute. So who am I to tell these people their own religious story? Well, the fact of the matter is the decisions are made about how I operate how, what our Christian audience may be interested in, and people are having an opinion on that with a complete lack of literacy. So when we make some of these programs, we have to understand that everybody we make programs for, and whether you're a journalist or an academic or, or just in every form of life, the people that we do things for often have no idea, irrespective of what their faith is. So as I said, I know a little bit about everything, but the vast majority of people know diddly squat about everything, as it were. And so because of that, we live in a world where integration is it's virtually impossible without a better understanding of religious and cultural literacy. Without religious and cultural literacy, integration, in my opinion, is very difficult to pull off without it becoming event essentially assimilation or isolation. The middle ground of integration will require everybody or whatever their faith is or no faith to understand that without that little bit of knowledge of, every, of, 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 every, of other faiths, we will never be able to integrate around all of us. So, thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Feldman from Burbeck University. He'll be talking to us about a model minority, question mark. That wasn't off the cuff. Thank you. That wasn't off the cuff. Um, yes, I was asked if I'd talk about the, um, uh, the comparisons which are sometimes made between the Jewish and the Muslim minorities in Britain. There is the idea that the Jewish minority constitutes a model minority. They perform this role in the imaginations of Enoch Powell, Margaret Thatcher, and most recently, David Cameron. In this respect, at least, apparently, Jews are indeed a light unto the nations. Earlier this year, David Cameron expressed his opinion that Jewish communities for centuries have been putting into practice his idea of the big society. They look after each other and integrate into the mainstream. This model of mutual support, social mobility, and political integration seems to be attractive to conservative politicians, but I think not only conservative politicians, who then use it as a model for other apparently more problematic minorities to follow. In the 1970s, the other minority was the population of immigrants from the Caribbean and their English-born children. More recently, of course, it is Muslims who have been the target of these unflattering comparisons. So what I want to discuss today are two things, really. One is the question of uh, the extent to which the Jewish experience in the UK, um, the extent to which this view of the Jewish experience in the UK is an accurate one or a helpful one when we think about Muslims in the UK. And secondly, what does the history of Jews in Britain tell us about the British model of integration? Are there ways in which this history helps us to understand why Muslim integration is a subject of debate and policy discussion in the early 21st century? Well, on the question of whether this is a helpful comparison, I think really it's important to understand that in most respects, what we're dealing with here are apples and pears. The Muslim population in contemporary Britain, in present-day Britain, is just much larger and much more diverse than the Jewish population ever was. As I'm sure uh, you will know, um, according to the census in 2011, there were 2.7 Muslims living in England and Wales. And one of the um, consequences of what sociologists call hyperdiversity is that the Muslim population comes now from many other parts of Asia, not only from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, many other parts of India, of, of Asia, and of course from Af parts of Africa as well. By contrast, there were 150,000 Jewish immigrants who came to the UK from Eastern Europe between 1880 and the First World War, and perhaps another 60,000 who came from Germany and Austria in the, 19, in the 1930s. So just in terms of size, we're talking, and in terms of diversity, we're talking with two very different sets, which I think undermines, in many ways, the usefulness of the comparison. The comparison is an inaccurate one, though, in a second way, because what it ignores is the extent to which the Jewish minority in Britain today is becoming less integrated, not more integrated, according to some measures. I th the two most important respects in which this applies is the rise, extraordinary rise, of separate Jewish schooling. 60% of Jewish children 
in England and Wales now enter Jewish, specifically Jewish schools. This is an unprecedentedly high figure. Something really quite extraordinary has happened there. And the second change, and the first change I've just spoken about might be related to the second change I'm about to mention, is the perception of rising anti-Semitism. 48% of Jews who were surveyed in 2013 saw the rise of anti-Semitism as a big problem. 68% thought that anti-Semitism had risen in Britain over the last five years. What we're seeing here, I think what this reflects, irrespective of real or imagined, whether these levels of anti-Semitism are real or imagined, what we're seeing here is a much greater willingness on the part of the Jewish population on the UK, in the UK to talk about anti-Semitism, to complain about anti-Semitism. I'm a historian, so I'm going to say something which you can trust me on. If you, took, if you were so moved to look at the Jewish newspapers from 1900 and compared them with the Jewish newspapers in Britain today, you would think that there was no anti-Semitism in Britain in, in 1900, and there was lots of it today. But I can tell you that that is not the case. There was plenty in 1900, and there's probably less today than there was in 1900. So there is a greater willingness to talk about anti-Semitism. And this has been um, described, this shift has been described, I think, illuminatingly by the sociologists Ben Gidley and Keith Kahn Harris as a shift from a strategy of security, a strategy of saying everything's OK, even when it's not, to saying everything isn't OK, we're really in peril. This strategy of in insecurity, it seems to me, is hardly a, um, um, a sign of successful integration, except perhaps in one respect. I think it actually reflects the Jewish population's integration within the politics of multiculturalism. Because within the politics of multiculturalism, it's actually, become, for the first time, it has become a good thing in British history, in, in British politics, to be a victim. You can make claims by parading your victim status. And, and just in that respect, perhaps, Jews are actually, in that political sense, are integrating um, when they complain about anti-Semitism. The last point um, I want to make in this respect is to say that Jews in Britain are not uniformly integrated. Most obviously, we can attend to the populations of ultra-Orthodox Jews, a Hasidim, a Mitnagim, in, in, in parts of North London, in Manchester, um, where there is not a lot of mixing, high degrees of segregation, and a lot of poverty, um, and a distance from mainstream British mores to the extent that recently one rabbi of a Hasidic group advised the women in that group that really they should not drive their children to school in a car. <coughs> Interestingly, not really much fuss is made by politicians and policymakers about this lack of integration, and that's something I will return to before I end. The next point I want to make about Jewish integration is that insofar as this has happened, and clearly it has happened to a degree, to a high degree. Um, it has taken place over several generations. And this should not be a surprise to anyone. The pioneer sociologists in Chicago Five in the minutes. 19... I'm sorry? Five minutes. Oh, my goodness. Um, um, in Chicago in the 1920s, who spoke about, um, who spoke about assimilation, people like Robert Park and Lewis Worth, 
saw this as a process taking place over four generations. The idea that somehow we should be surprised that there's a relative lack of integration, according to some measurements, among uh, populations who have been in the country for, for less long is not at all surprising. I also want to make um, two more points before concluding. One point is one Im really important difference between the Jewish population and the Muslim population is the degree of institutional centralization of the Jewish community. This is a process which emerged, this is a situation which emerged in the 19th century as the, as the established Jewish population worked hand in hand with the state to, and used that power that they received from the state to force out, marginalize, rabbis who promoted Jewish law in, where it con stood in, in a contradiction uh, to British law, and they used that power to discipline the immigrants. Indeed, earlier today, people have spoken about the sort of good Muslim, bad Muslim contrast in rhetoric. That also existed with Jews. To a degree, it, ex it still exists now, but it also existed within the Jewish community itself. The last point I want to make is about political integration. Now, Jews seem very well integrated politically. That's an extraordinarily recent development. In the 1890s, they were regarded as anarchists. In the First World War, they were regarded as shirkers. In the 1920s, they were regarded as Bolsheviks, and the Zionists were Bolsheviks as well. This, I, in, in 1948, there were anti-Jewish riots in Liverpool, Leeds, and Manchester after Jewish guerrillas in Palestine sh killed two British sergeants. So, clearly, this isn't a mark of political integration. The integration of Jews really occurred not merely after 1948 and, and the creation of the State of Israel, but really after 1956 and the Suez debacle. Because after that point, there became a much greater um, intersection of the interests of those Jews who were Zionists, and, uh, and by then, most Jews did support the State of Israel, and the interests of the British government. And it is this political point on which I want to conclude. Because it was when you know, Bill Clinton had a notice on his wall which said, it's the economy, stupid. In these matters of integration, one minute. As you notice, ought to be its politics, stupid. If only people were more concerned about poverty and segregation and separation, if they were, they would be concerned about the Hasidim in North London, but they are not. People were concerned about Jewish integration when Jews were seen as anarchists and Bolshevists and as Zionists when Zionists were in conflict with the British state. Now they're not. And it seems to me it is there that we have an illuminating, uh, something which can illumine our understanding of Muslim integration. Not illumine our understanding of social mobility, the lack of its segregation or the lack of it, but why, when and why politicians find this alarming. And the reasons they find this alarming is because of the politics. Stupid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our last but final, um, final speaker, but certainly not least, is uh, Professor Anthony Heath from the University of Oxford, who will be speaking um, on moving the conversation forward. Thank you. 
I grew up in Liverpool in the 1940s and 50s, and I remember in Liverpool at that time, there wasn't any, as I remember or was aware of, any anti-Jewish uh, prejudice or hostility. There wasn't any anti-Muslim prejudice and hostility, but there was anti-Catholic, anti-Irish Catholic prejudice uh, and uh, dislike and discrimination. Um, and it didn't take four generations. I think in my lifetime, we have seen the Catholics become another model integrated minority. Uh, their achievements are equal on almost every dimension to those of the white British. The prejudice um, and sort of anti-Catholic feeling that we used to have has almost totally vanished. So in my own lifetime, there has been a transformation um, taken 50, 60 years perhaps. I don't see why we can't have something similar, um, I hope rather faster than the next 50 or 60 years. I don't see why it shouldn't be over the next 20 years uh, in the uh, case of Muslim uh, integration. I'm going to advance six theses uh, from, I must confess, a very classic British liberal tradition. That's what I belong to. My first thesis is that we must make a sharp distinction between integration and assimilation. In the liberal tradition, um, there are many issues which are matters of private concern only and are not the business of the state. These are to do with beliefs, identities, and values. They are not issues which, those are concerns for an assimilationist, for someone who takes a liberal view, those are not proper matters of government intervention. You should be allowed as an individual to choose whatever values, identities you wish. They are not matters for public concern unless they have negative impacts on other people. So when we talk about, within the liberal tradition about integration, we're talking about areas where there is legitimate concern for government intervention. That's my first thesis. Integration is not a euphemism for assimilation. It's something very different. By integration, my second thesis, I'm going to focus on uh, economic integration, uh, particularly in terms of economic activity, uh, access to the labor market, uh, and to uh, good jobs, civic integration, political integration. Um, but also, I think importantly, uh, I want to talk about uh, obeying the law, um, and about avoidance of committing crime. I think this is a legitimate dimension of state interference and uh, high rates of incarceration or criminal activity would, in, I think, on a, in this liberal view, be a matter of concern uh, for the state, a legitimate matter of concern. My third thesis is that on some of these criteria, although not equally uh, uh, on all, there is empirical evidence of uh, some integration gaps, that is to say, lack of Muslim integration on some of these dimensions. Um, I, should, I, want, I want to add, though, that this is not unique to Muslims. There are integration <laughs> gaps for other groups in British society, particularly poorly qualified white British youngsters, I think, are poorly integrated if we take the same criteria that we have set up um, for uh, d discussing uh, faith uh, integration. I also uh, sometimes wonder how well integrated the super rich are in British society. That's a separate issue which I need to look at. My fourth thesis is that Integration of Muslims and of uh, other faith communities in Britain is already better than it is in almost any other European country. Um, and if you know of a country which is, has, um, has been more successful in integrating uh, minorities and, and different faiths, I'd love to know about it and love to know what the evidence base is. So, fourth thesis is Britain is pretty good when it comes to integration, or putting it differently, perhaps, Muslims are pretty good 
when it comes to integrating in British society. And what's more, what we are seeing is improvement. Integration in Britain is, in, is getting better over time. It's particularly getting better, as other speakers have already pointed out, across generations. If we compare uh, recent migrants with people born and educated in Britain and with the third generation whose uh, parents were, were born here, we can see very clear narrowing of many of these integration gaps. So many of the integration gaps are going away of their own accord without any need for any government interference. Government should leave well alone unless there is evidence that intervention is needed to speed things up. I think some things could be speeded up, and I think you know, greater attention to uh, providing resources for learning English um, for, for recent migrants would actually speed up integration. But, but on the whole, I think you know, if it's not broke, don't mend it. In, in many respects, Britain is already doing well and is likely to continue to do well and better uh, in the future. So I think that's my fourth thesis. But the fifth thesis is that there are some integration gaps which are quite stubborn, which are remaining. And one I've already referred to in my talk yesterday was uh, with respect to unemployment, the very high unemployment rates and poverty rates of British Muslims. Um, I think, but I haven't got the facts and figures at my fingertips, that uh, incarceration rates, which I think are very important, are also quite stubborn, um, and maybe worse in the second generation than in the first generation. So there are integration gaps which need to be addressed. To know whose responsibility they are, we need to understand the drivers of those gaps. Without a proper understanding of the causal mechanisms, what is generating these gaps, we cannot have sensible policy or sensible interventions. Moralizing responses, which are not based on proper causal evidence, are of course just as likely to make things worse as to make them better. And in many areas, we do not actually understand what the causes of the remaining integration gaps are. So that's my fifth thesis. We need to have better understanding of the drivers before we come up with policy interventions, because they may be counterproductive. And I believe many, well, I believe most policy interventions are actually utterly ineffective and a waste of money, um, but some can actually be counterproductive. And then I think I should have a sixth thesis, which is that we do know about some of the barriers. So I think if we're looking at the drivers um, of lack of integration, we can very crudely distinguish those, um, them into ones which are due to barriers, institutional barriers, intentional or otherwise, in British society. And on the other hand, matters of choice or an unwillingness to integrate on the part of the relevant communities. It could be either or it could be a combination. I don't know. It's a matter for investigation. But my sixth thesis is we do know that there are barriers in the form of racial, uh, faith, symbolic discrimination. That in a, and from a liberal perspective, our first job is to ensure that we British liberals cannot be blamed for being hypocrites and failing to ensure that British society is a land that offers equality of opportunity. When we have achieved equality of opportunity and have shown and have removed the barriers due to discrimination, then it may become clear that some, there is continuing lack of integration, which might have other causes which we could then address. My suspicion, but it's, it's perhaps a matter of hope rather than, rather than of evidence, is if we remove the barriers and provide opportunities. So Five minutes. Five minutes. I only need one minute. If we remove the barriers, then I believe that other the, the communities which lack integration at the moment 
will gladly avail themselves of the opportunities and that the, any desires to be different, to be separate, to be apart, will be removed. First job, and I think the primary job, is to get rid of the barriers. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you uh, to all our panellists. Uh, for this final Q&A session, I'd like to invite the Nuhud scholars back on stage to participate. It's going to be a very dynamic Q&A session, and I think uh, we'd love to hear a bit more from our Nuhud scholars. So if you could all come back up on stage. So first question over here. Thank you. I, I enjoyed that. And there, was a, there was a lot I could speak about, but I would like to put a very simple question um, to, to Matthew. Now, I, I may have, and I apologize if I missed it because I was in a conversation outside and I came in a little bit late. Um, but I just wondered whether, particularly in the view of the panel before, which talked about reclaiming from the margins, um, there is another, uh, if you want, model um, besides the, the normal paradigm of um, Mecca Medina and the Hijra to Medina, which is actually the, the migration from um, Mecca to uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and I, uh, that's, of course, a marginal um, community, but it may offer some scope from that perspective that offers a way forward for um, Muslim communities that go into non-Muslim societies right from the very origins of Islamic history. Thank you. Uh, the second question was over here, but yes, so you've already got a mic, that's great. And then there's a gentleman over here and this man here. So let's take Nizam's question. Cool. Um, hi, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd be very interested in knowing what your opinions are on the relationship and trade-off between Muslim and integration. Um, Akil talked about religious literacy. Um, is there a relationship between religiosity of Muslim and integration, particularly as generations go on? Um, there's a gentleman here. So my question is directed to um, Dr. Matthew Wilkinson, and it's regarding his, this uh, model, the um, Islamic critical realism model. And it's uh, specifically about one aspect of the triad of his model, which uh, pertains to the epistemological relativism. And that's um, uh, justifying um, uh, critical and self-critical traje trajectories in the Qur'an. So um, I think of one verse which is oft repeated in, throughout Islamic scholarship, Sami'ana wa ta'ana, we heard and we obeyed. My question to you is how do we justify um, the critical position which you've taken in this part of your uh, model? Thank you. Okay, and uh, because there are two questions there to Matthew specifically, can I take a third? I think there was a gentleman here that wanted to ask on. Yeah, and I'll come to you in the next round. So uh, in the second row here, or third row as it were. Thanks, yeah. Um, that was really, really interesting, and, and I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things. I completely take the point that was made about the lack of religious literacy. And I want to connect that to the idea of barrier to integration. It seems to me absolutely without question that lack of knowledge, it, what was it, everybody's got a total lack of knowledge of everything. You know, let's be completely uh, skeptical about it. That surely is a huge barrier. And, and most of the problems we have are because of ignorance of each other. But what do we do about that? And I, I'm skeptical about the ability of the media to be able to bridge that gap. How are we going to get people to know each other better, assuming that that is a major barrier to, to, to all-round integration with each other, not just one group having to integrate with another group, but us all getting our act together? How are we going to do that? Okay, so we'll take a few more questions after that. If we start maybe with you, Matthew, because there are two questions addressed to you. If you maybe recap them as you, before you answer. Yes. Um, to the gentleman um, at the top there, it's a very good point you made. Thank you for bringing it up. I think jurisprudentially we've got a lot to learn from situations where Muslims migrated um, as to be a minority in a Christian or another non-Muslim setting, and one can think of other ones. Sicily, for example, is another case where Muslims became a, a minority under a, a, a Christian rulership, and there are others. So I do think we've got a lot to learn from them, bearing in mind that the geopolitical and 
other conditions of, of those times are very different from our own. Um, the re the, the, I, think, I think that's a very good point. The reason why I chose the emblematic story of the Prophet Muhammad to exemplify the dialectics of critical realism action in history is because the purpose of this philosophy is to present Islam to young people and children for whom those stories are already part and parcel of, of what they've accepted about their religion. So in a sense, I've taken things which are, un, in, in, this, in the sense that people always learn them, are things that young people are going to recognize as part of their story. And that's why I chose that majority narrative. Does that um, answer your question? Well, I totally agree, and please bear in mind, I had 50 minutes to compress a 270-page book. So, um, seven years' research and quite a lot. So. That, that means buy the book. <laughs> um, so, if we move on to uh, the second question, which was the relationship, uh, the, the question posed by Nizam about the relationship between Muslims and integration. So, um, I'll be so bold as to put the question to the uh, per people I like to hear from, if that's okay. Um, and specifically amongst the Nahud scholars, so you've got a little time to get your thoughts together. I'd love to hear thoughts from Alia and Omar on this particular question. Uh, but I'll come first to Professor Nielsen, if that's all right, to hear um, what your thoughts are on that. Sorry, you're going to have to remind me what the question was. Nizam, do you want to repeat your question? Can, Just shout. Uh, the trade-off between religiosity and being Muslim and integration, and whether there's a relationship, in particular when you consider generations Trade-off makes it sounds like an awfully dirty commercial bargain. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, it's probably not what you mean. I, I meant it in the context of do you, are they mutually exclusive? Is there a relationship between the two? Or, for example, as I mean, my experience tells me that the more integrated, especially when you consider socioeconomic elements of integration, levels of religiosity perhaps might change and differ. The discussion now of Muslim integration will be very different from what Muslims might mean in 20 years' time and what integration might mean. And I mean, this is, this is essentially... Yeah, I've, I've, I've long argued that one of the processes that uh, is happening among uh, Muslim minorities of immigrated origin, differently in different countries, and certainly differently between Western Europe and North America, for social cultural reasons. One of the things is that um, Muslims are identifying, um, and they've got the skills to do this. Particularly, I mean, it's one of the things the intellectual criti critical skills they've picked up in uh, through school um, is to. Learn to distinguish between what is essential to being a Muslim and what is culturally relative. That very often brings them into conflict with their parents and sometimes with their local mosque leaders. But basically, uh, I've argued that one of the processes is that there's a kind of cultural undressing going on um, in the process of which Muslims identify what is necessary to retain, develop, uh, to be Muslim, and then a cultural redressing, um, so that instead of being a Kashmiri Muslim, you are a Scouse Muslim. Um, of course, in that process, you don't have a, a, a harmony of answers. I mean, people reach different conclusions as to what is essential to being a Muslim. Um, it may be various forms of um, external religiosity. It is in some cases. In other cases, it's some form of internal religiosity, uh, internal piety. Uh, but I also think you have to be careful about what you mean by religiosity. Um, because, I mean, if you go back to the countries of origin, or I, I don't know Kashmir, but I know Lebanon and Syria very well, um, the, the, the level of religiosity there within a kind of generally Muslim cultural space, but 
the religiosity levels can be surprisingly low. Um, so, uh, if anything, one possibly sees an increase in religiosity uh, in, in the minority situation. So, um, yeah. And, and I don't like to hold the word, but I'd, I'd like to answer that question because I do actually have some evidence about it, which is I'd like to share with you. Um, the research about, especially about Muslim young people in education in Britain in state schools, shows a very interesting thing, which is that re religiosity can both be a platform for educational engagement and success, and it can be an obstacle and a, and a stumbling block. And that partly explains the difference we heard about yesterday between the way that um, Muslim women in Britain and, and females are doing better at school and at university, and, and Muslim boys, and especially in the Pakistani origin groups, uh, are lagging behind and not doing well. Because it shows that it's been much, for some reason, easier for Muslim girls to mobilize their faith as a platform for success for getting on at school, and for Muslim boys, they've tended to use their faith as a, as a position to resist the authority of schools and to construe learning in state schools as white and un-Islamic and therefore uncool. So, so there, there is, so religiosity, um, as it's played out at the moment, can go both ways. And I think it's very important that as responsible adults, we work to ensure that the re religiosity of young people acts to propel them towards success rather than failure. Can I get some of the Nuhu scholars to respond on that? Anyone want to come back? Uh, yeah, um, with regard to Nizam's question. Yeah. Um, uh, I worked on a research project that actually um, addresses this directly. Um, a few years ago, um, it was run by the Lokahi Foundation, and it was looking at um, uh, faith as a factor in, in terms of integration. Um, and it was a comparative study looking at different faith communities and whether religious observance affected um, social and other um, integra integration markers. Um, and very interestingly, it showed that um, higher levels of religious observance, however that's measured internally within their c different communities, be it Muslim, evangelical, Hindu, whatever, uh, higher religious observance led to um, greater investment in civil society and a greater investment in interacting socially with others. Um, now, it was a small study, um, but I think it's very important that it was comparative because, um, as, as I mentioned yesterday, um, a, a lot of the research on this issue does tend to be very Muslim-focused and it just kind of increases the problem of Muslim exceptionalism and Muslim problematization of Muslims. Um, but I think it does, it does uh, have something co to contribute. Um, but that doesn't, I think, cancel out the concern that sometimes there can be a tendency um, of, by religiously observant communities to self-segregate um, because it's, you know, because the, the, the need for uh, controlling sort of cultural and social reproduction within the community, um, controlling the, you know, or, or kind of reproducing for um, the younger generation, um, sometimes social segregation is, you know, seen as a, as a way to ensure that. Um, so, yeah, it can go both ways, I think. Thanks, Alia. Um, Archibald, I think the next question was... Mm. Uh, well, I'll let you kick off with that one, which was about the lack of religious li literacy and what do we do about that? And is media part of the problem or is it part of the solution? Well, I'll just kick off with a little bit about Nizam's question and maybe I misunderstood the question because that, that my response would have been very different. Um, and my response is that, if you look, particularly if you look at that Cardiff University study about the religiosity of young children, that the, you know, it, does, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that in vast... Parts, vast parts of the country, young Muslim children, uh, Muslim children are more religious than their parents, or, or they're, they're as religious or they're more religious. And that's an issue that you, you don't, it, what, when we talk about economic progression, etc., what normally happens is people become more secular over time. That's what we've seen in various different religions and various different cultures across the country, and as, uh, across the West. And as we live in a, in a post-Christian Europe where religion is, has been taken out of the public space and no longer is something, it doesn't have the impact that it had in previous times, when you do have that increase in religiosity, uh, it effectively means that it... it, it the things that we are now experiencing in certain geographical locations where Muslims, in this particular, using as an, this particular example, may be uh, in the majority and may have particularly uh, what we can describe as conservative views on segregation or on education or whatever those things may be in comparison to what the established liberal views may be of the rest of society, then, yeah, 
it's happening. And, thing, and the conversations that we've been ha I've been having and we've been having is actually to try and understand in terms of what that language we can, what, what's the kind of language we can use to describe these incidents when they happen. Because anybody that thinks that what happened in Birmingham in schools in a couple of years ago was a one-off is probably fooling themselves. It is a glimpse of a particular future in certain geographical locations because of the increase of in, relig in terms of religiosity, not just of children, but of lots of people. And it is irrespective of your socioeconomic uh, uh, background or what your particular job level may be, or your income stream may be, it seems that in, in, the, in, in a numbers game, that Muslims are not becoming more secular, which is what is the norm. And that's why it's standing out more than it is for other particular cultures. And I think that's something for us to think about. I'm not particularly saying that that's a black and white answer, but I think we have to think about that in terms of that. And that then fits in with answering your question as well, which is because that's happening, because we've had that post-Christian Europe century or more than a century, because we've had all of that, and because certain, uh, because of, uh, you know, f for many people, Islam feels very alien, uh, but also, to be honest with you, so does Sikhism, so does Christianity, you know? I mean, I I've had to explain to some very, very well-educated people that Jesus was Jewish, um, when they wanted to know why am I obsessed with the Jewish Jesus program, I said, because he's Jewish, and we laughed, and then I realized, hey, you don't realize, yeah, sorry, he's Jewish. Uh, and I had to explain this to somebody. And this is some, one of the most senior people and brilliant minds I've ever worked with in television. So, the, you know, you've got two ways we can deal with this. One is, let's just say, well, what can we do? Or we, I mean, I, I'm the father of teenage kids who have gone through the education system, and we can, we, a much maligned education system with religious education. But my kids know a hell of a lot more at their age than I did. And both my daughters have gone on to study at, uh, uh, at GCSE and an and, and A-level. So effectively, there's a much more of an interest in this subject than there was before. So I think there are children, if they go through that, if it's compulsory, if they go through it and they're taught well, they will learn something. But the bigger point we have to make is we have to accept this is an issue. The, the, the rest of society has to accept it. You know, it's no point blaming the media because the media is made up of society. So within society, if there is this lack of religious literacy, the media can't be blamed for it because effectively the, 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 the workforce comes from that particular pool. So until we accept it, until we say that this may be a barrier to integration or this may be a barrier to economic development for the nation, uh, this may be a barrier to kind of uh, social cohesion, until we accept that is the case, that we are all to blame, then I don't think we can progress other than individual pockets of progression. And those individual pockets of progression from school children, who have more, a bit of more knowledge, through to people becoming people with that knowledge then getting jobs of, to be able to influence what is decided around them. Without that, those are little pockets. They will make a bit of a difference, but they won't, be the ultimate, they won't make the ultimate difference, and the ultimate difference will only come from acceptance of its importance as a subject. Can we, can we take a few more questions? Uh, uh, so, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. No, can I just answer the question of the gentleman at the top who we haven't addressed? Sure. Um, very briefly, epistemological relativism. What I was describing was a philosoph philosophical response to the nature of the universe. Um, so so that, that's where the epistemological relativity comes in. Uh, the universe is there, it exists, but the human responses to it are always contextualized, grounded in, in realities. Um, but in terms of semi ane wa um, that, that's no exception, because the, 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 the practice of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was that if, if something had come down, as we believe, uh, as a revelation from God, uh, people either did it or stopped doing it. Alcohol, when the, when the final prohibition came down, uh, people stopped. Um, and that came from God. But in matters that regarded the governance of the community and military strategy and things like that, the closest companions <coughs> and others questioned the prophet, the prophet about his strategy. It wasn't a blind following. You know, after, up before some of the most important engagements of Islam, he consulted his companions about the most appropriate way forward. So there is, there is a, definitely an ethic in Islam that we respect authority and we advise it and we, when, it, when it's um, appropriately engaged with the, the polity and the civic body, we obey it. I totally agree with that. But nevertheless, even that is, is from a critical position where each individual believer is answerable to God for what they, or they do. Thank you. I know uh, Mohammed does want to come back really quickly, if that's possible, because I want to get back to the audience, if that's all right. No, I wanted to just reflect on the last couple of days. So if you okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so can I take three more questions? So the lady here... We'll come to you. 
Who's got the mic? Oh. It's all right, don't worry. Um, thank you. My name's Asma Mustafa. I'm from Oxford. Um, quick question for Anthony. I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I think I read somewhere that you've mentioned um, that at the moment, in terms of policymakers, that there's no political will for change. That there's no political will for change amongst policymakers when it comes to structural inequality. Um, and if that's the case, um, in this context, what's the role, or is the role of academics and researchers redundant? And a quick question for Akhil. Um, what's the role in terms of diversity and inclusion through things like comedy, drama, music and sport? What drives that agenda? Um, is it quite ad hoc? Is it a long-term strategy at the BBC? And um, your thoughts on that? Great, thank you. There's a question down here. Anyone else? Any hands? Yeah, there's a, a gentleman up there. And we'll come to you after that. Mohammed Amin, my question is for Professor Nielsen, and I'm interested in comparing British Muslims and continental European Muslims, particularly with regard to the active use and adoption of national symbols and histories for their own integration purposes. So, for example, in the UK, I'm thinking of things like the poppy hijab, active participation in Remembrance Day, where we have Muslim representatives laying wreaths on Remembrance Day, and the extent to which European Muslims do or do not adopt use of their national flags, other parts of their national histories, for example, commemorating the fall of the Bastille in France, etc. Thank you. There's a question for the gentleman all the way at the top there. So maybe we take this one on the left here and then we'll come to you so that we'll get all of them in. The gentleman just here in the shirt. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question, I think, is uh, broader. Uh, I liked uh, uh, Professor Heath's uh, six theses. And the question I would like to ask is that for those, those of us who are Muslims, and especially the young, the, the young Muslims, do you think that there are young Muslims who should also come to some sort of cognizance of what their, their thesis should be as well? as a contribution. And here I'm thinking of one particular area which I wonder can cause some sort of a displacement for young Muslims. You know, when we looked at the typologies that are often presented, they were presented during a time when there were empires. So this notion of Darul Islam was born. And you have Darul Islam versus Darul Adr. So is it that Muslim youth must create a thesis in which we reconceptualize the Darul Islam in some other format? Because we are now nation states and democracies. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the gentleman up here, all the way up there. Sorry. Um, my question is, um, I mean, there was a tendency I uh, observed, in my humble opinion, to separate uh, uh, cause from effect. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, my first question is, uh, the scholar, I do, uh, do forgive my uh, poor memory, who dealt with, um, I believe who dealt with um, issues, uh, in the second one from the right, uh, you spoke about shifting yeah. allegiances, shifting allegiances, meaning that things that were not pointed out some time ago are pointed out today vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Muslim community. Uh, for example, the far right, extreme right today, uh, maybe 50 years ago, they wouldn't even have thought about uh, gender equality or uh, homosexuality or stuff like that. But today you notice that they say that Muslims are against gay. And, get, and, get gay. and ju just this in an attempt to kind of demonize uh, uh, Muslims, so to speak. I, I think I'm articulating my thoughts uh, uh, clearly. But we see that people are shifting their allegiances in order to uh, demonize Muslims, even if that means accepting things that 50 years ago they wouldn't have accepted. So isn't it pointless somehow to uh, envisage some kind of 
uh, integration, since whatever we do, somehow they will always find something wrong in us. The other question is, just okay. another question is that... I, I'm really just sorry, I don't think we have time because we still have to get all of those in and we were supposed to wrap okay, up. Then. But thank you so much. Can we, can we uh, try and keep the responses as short as possible, please? Um, I'm going to come back to the questions. So, Professor Heath, there were two questions to you. So maybe we'll leave off with you, you if that's okay. Do you need a recap on them or are you clear? Uh, yes, can I have a recap, please? Yeah, so uh, one of them was, is there no political will for change? And the second were, was about whether young Muslims should be developing their own theses. Yes. Um, well, on the, on the first one, yes, I, I've certainly argued um, in, in the past that there was no political will. Um, I was quite surprised with uh, David Cameron's recent speech at the Conservative Party conference, he actually did talk about discrimination. And I think there are uh, suggestions um, that uh, the government does want to do something about that. Um, so I think maybe, I, I think it was true of the last um, government. Um, I'm slightly more optimistic. Um, I'm in some conversations with the cabinet office uh, I think they might be trying to do something. I think as an academic, um, one has to be careful not to model up too much sort of the activist role um, and the sort of the lobbying role, which I think I would quite like to play from, but that might endanger my other role, which is to provide dispassionate evidence. So I think your sort of second question, I, I think it is quite tricky um, because it's very easy to wander over the borderline. And if I became too activist, I suspect I wouldn't be taken seriously when I provide the evidence. Oh, they say, oh, it's just Anthony sounding off as usual about his pet hobby horses. So I think as an academic, one has to stick with what the evidence is. And a lot of my role is simply trying to present evidence to government. So it's speaking truth to power tell them the truth, don't tell them what they want to hear. Um, if they choose to ignore me, that's their right and, and in a sense, their responsibility. They're elected, I'm not. Yeah, uh, and the second question was about the different theses. Do you think we need to move on from this Dar al-Islam, Dar al-Halb? Is that something that you would speak to? Or? I could speak to that. Um, well, can I, uh, I think it's very interesting um, set of questions. I've not really thought about it. That's fine. Maybe, maybe if Matthew then okay. wants yeah. a response. <coughs> That's a very important question. Um, and I, I think that young people definitely need to take um, creative ownership of thinking about what the nature of the world that they live in is, Islamically speaking. Um, and regarding Dar al-Islam and Dar and Dar al-Kufr, Dar al, -Kufr, Dar al the other part of that binary, I think it's very, very important to realise that, that those constructions, and they lasted a long time, and they might, you could say they lasted for, um, you know, for maybe a thousand years, um, but they were, um, they were political and human constructions. They're, they're not designated in the Quran and the Sunnah. They're, they're not essential to the, to the religion of Islam, and they serve to describe a, a world when international relations were usually undertaken at the point of a sword. Um, of course, at the moment, um, we live under an, a nexus of international relations that are governed by treaties, by tre uh, signed up to by Muslim and non-Muslim countries, uh, by alliances, by visas, by passports, by a whole different configuration of, of transaction across international borders. So I think it's crucial that young people take ownership of deciding what the nature of the world Islamically is that they live in. Outside the Middle East, talk, still talk about Dar al Islam and Dar al Harb. Dar al Harb for the people who, who talked about it first, first meant countries who were at war with the Muslim state. So in, during the Second World War, Germany was Dar al Harb uh, as regards the British here. But to keep saying the divisions of Dar al Harb and Dar al Kufr and so on, this is they're dead, long dead and gone from the discussion in the central Muslim lands. Thanks for the clarification, Professor. Um, Akil, um, on to you. What drives the agenda at the BBC? We'd all 
Well, if you're any broadcaster, whether you're funded by a licence for your advertising, you funded, you're, you're, you want people to watch your programmes. So if it's rubbish, nobody would watch it. Now, you can have... If you're talking about Citizen Khan, I presume, if you're talking about comedy, I mean, you might not like it. It's not... I actually know I do very well, and I go through the scripts, and it's not my idea of comedy, but I quite, I, there are bits of it which I quite like. Um, I think there's a general point, which is uh, we want to reflect society all broadcasters do if you're in if you're in the broadcasting market and uh, and and if something's very good or if something you feel will be watched by a lot of people you do so therefore that's why you will have say Nadia on Bake Off not necessarily Nadia winning Bake Off that's not that would be fixing things but <laughs> Nadia being a contestant on Bake Off or, or anyone is simply because you want to reflect society so first of all she has to be good at you know I've produced shows many many years ago and actually I remember I produced a quiz show called Bollywood or Bust about 25 years ago if any of you remember that on Bollywood cinema and uh, we had a, an academic I think from this institution in fact from SOAS turned up who was an expert on uh, on Sanskrit and she turned up at the, in, at the interview stage, and she was white. And I put her straight in, simply because she was the, our cultural diversity on that show. So the thing is, there's a lot of, you know, 25 years on, you need that cultural diversity. And when it comes to something like sport, you know, I, we did a program a couple of years ago on the Muslim Premier League, which is about, about at that time, 50, over 50 Muslims in the Premier League playing football. And one of the great things that came out was this story of Steven Gerrard and the fact that most footballers in this country are way ahead of everybody else when it comes to religious literacy of Muslims. It may sound like the most, one of the most ridiculous things you're going to hear, but we should all learn from premiership footballers. <laughs> well, I think on the day, no, would agree no, with no. you. <laughs> because on the day that they won the League Cup, the, the, the team doctor is a Muslim, and he told us this story that Steven Gerrard said to him, he said, Zaf, we're going to spray champagne around in the dressing room. We don't want to offend you. So if you want to come back in 20 minutes, if that is difficult for you, come back in 20 minutes. <laughs> he came back 20 minutes later. They'd hung his, his, his suit, his shoes, his bags. His, they'd hung it all outside. <laughs> so that he... Because that, now that lack of knowledge... You know, let's ask Muslims living in Bradford or Bolton, all those places where I grew up, and ask them, do they have that same lack of knowledge and awareness for people of other faiths? So that's the issue. It says it's not about wanting to ch engineer the world. It's just that when the world is changing around you, you have to reflect it. But, and I think Omar wants to come back quite quickly on that one, if that's all right. Yeah, I mean, I totally appreciate that point. I think uh, I actually spoke to, with Dr. Um, Iqbal as part of the research. I interviewed him. And um, he actually mentioned the, the, the point in terms of the, uh, the game, I think it was a Champions League match, where uh, his clothes were put, put on the side. But um, interestingly, from other football players that I've also interviewed, um, most of them have said that uh, because they're respected as football players, and within, uh, let's, let's just, just a, you know, uh, important point, not to be naive, and within the realm of sport, Muslim football players are seen as assets, as opposed to Muslim human beings, so to speak. So that's a very critical point here because I have to respect Muslim football players because I, have, I am paying their wage, I'm paying their salary. I am relying on those players to score goals, to win trophies. Then Baba had his name being called out amongst 50,000 Newcastle fans because he was scoring goals. Most, most importantly, because he was scoring goals. Not because he was, you know, Senegalese descent and Muslim. Yes, they appreciated that. They appreciated the fact that he was fasting during Ramadan. But, again, the, the notion, again, you, 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 I think someone on the panel mentioned Nadia from, from the British Bake Off. And my, my, my point uh, when I discussed this is, I mean, Nadia was baking cakes. She wasn't talking about the topic of integration as we are doing today. So she's accepted. Um, other football players who are Muslim are accepted because they are perceived as a football player as opposed to an ethnic minority. So that's the point I just want to make. Thank you. Um, Professor Nielsen on poppy hijabs and remembrance. I don't think there's a simple answer because the moment you start talking about national symbols, um, you have to consider nation. And the British sense of nationhood is a much, much weaker sense of nationhood than is the German and the French, for example. But at the same time, the German and the French f senses of nationhood are very different in character. Um, one of the reasons why Germany is, was so long uh, in, well, like three generations before they started uh, generally dishing out German passports to Turkish residents 
was because the German concept of nationhood was one of inheritance, uh, which was why they so could, could so easily bring in thousands and thousands of ethnic Germans from Central Asia after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Whereas the French sense of nationhood is one based on citizenship, um, on the citizen and the right of the participation of the citizen. It was very interesting in that context that at the time of the protests against the plans to introduce hijab ban in secondary schools in France, um, it was a very telling protest that the women wore hijab in French flag colors. Um, you couldn't have done that in Germany. And the whole concept, the whole feeling about nationhood in this country is so lazy that why bother? And then in, in, in one sense, that's why uh, ELD and, the, uh, and BNP find it so easy to occupy the St. George's flag. Um, it was actually quite cheery a few years ago when uh, England, when, when the Rugby World Cup was being played in Australia and, and, and England was moving through very successfully that uh, lots of Asians recaptured the flag of St. George and you saw Asians driving around Birmingham with the flag of St. George, Asian supporters of the England team. Uh, but that was, that was quite unusual. Um, but I mean, it, it, it is enormously different. There, there isn't a general answer. I'm afraid I'm too academic of that. <laughs> Um, I don't know if Fatim uh, would like to come back on this because your research is on issues to do with dress. Is there any comments you'd like to come back on on that? Um, I can't remember the exact question, it, sorry. Which it was, was to do about... with, oh, well, it was um, Mohammed Amin's question about poppy hijabs and uh, the... Um, national symbols. National symbols. <laughs> the use of national yeah. symbols. Um, I mean, national symbolism wasn't a, um, a topic or a theme that came up in the conversations uh, with the women that I interviewed or even, uh, even the men. Um, the hijab was just simply treated as something, I mean, again, there were multifaceted sort of responses to the hijab itself where to some women it meant, um, you know, a, a relationship with God, or, or for some of them, it was a political statement of, of asserting their Muslimness and being in spaces like Tower Hamlets Council, being in spaces like secondary schools, sixth forms, where they did feel a need um, uh, to express that. So poppy hijabs didn't really come up. Um, but um, I mean, personally, I had my reservations about the whole campaign itself. And um, but yeah, it wasn't something that came up in the, in the no my research. Um, the final question is for Zia, but I'm very aware that, um, David, are there any final thoughts you'd like to make? So Zia, I'm going to hand to you for the question, which was about shifting allegiances that you mentioned in your talk. And then we'll end with Mohammed, if that's OK, to make a final comment. Yeah. Um, hey, man. <laughs> yeah, you make a, you make a, a really sound point. Um, and probably one of the most troubling findings um, is exactly what you said. Um, so for example, take um, the Prophet's marriage to Aisha. Um, that is a, you know, a classic example. Middle Ages, it's, no one says anything. Victorian times, you start getting people who are like, oh, well, maybe Aisha was just a bit too young to take on the duties of marriage. And, in, and But then you have a lot of other Victorian writers who'd be saying, oh, no, this was normal back then, and, you know, the Eastern woman, you know, develops faster, and so it's justifiable, etc. And it seems as the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the sexual deviant category of paedophilia was constructed uh, in around the late 1800s and the demonization of that, as that increased, so did the antagonism towards the prophet's marriage to Aisha. So there was a correlation between if we don't, if we don't like something, then you must do it. And then you're probably guilty of it. And that, that is a, a worrying fact. And there are, are other examples, but I'll leave it there. Okay, well, thank you for, for this opportunity. Yeah. No problem. Um, this is just a, a reflection on the last two days. Um, I'm a little bit saddened that there aren't more people from government in here. Um, there haven't been over the last two days. Um, and I say this as somebody who worked in government for uh, quite a long spell. Um, and I know that this isn't for lack of trying, um, 
But I feel that the situation is getting very polarized now. Um, government is moving towards this very unfortunate position um, on prevent in terms of how it's covering nonviolent extremism. Um, and I think here in this hall over the last couple of days, we've been fairly critical of where government is going. Um, but I think for the welfare of our society, we need to find a middle ground between the government and large sections of the Muslim community. And right now what we need, and I hope this is where we're moving towards with the Nahud project as well, is bridge builders between government, policy people, and the Muslim communities. And I think just two points on the two sort of issues that we've spoken about at great length to, uh, yesterday and today. The first is on the issue of security or prevent. Um, I think in the Muslim community, we have to be honest and I think we have to uh, we have to accept that there is a problem here. Um, and we need to look into the causes of the problems, as many people have said. Um, but we also need to work towards preventing another atrocity like 9-11 or 7-7. Um, and if we feel, as a lot of people have said, that the prevent strategy we have coming from government isn't going to work, then I think the onus is on us to find an alternative strategy to do prevent in the Muslim community. And the old excuse that we don't have the resource in the Muslim community just doesn't wash anymore. We raised 100 million pounds last Ramadan for charity work internationally. If we are serious about dealing with this problem, we can find the resources in the Muslim community. Yeah. Very quickly, the second point on integration. Very, very quickly. Very quickly. It's a very flippant um, example, but it illustrates I think how I feel about this, and it's this, that I come from India, uh, Bangladesh, and a lot of people here come from Bangladesh. And if I went to a wedding in India or Bangladesh or Bangladeshi community here, inevitably the bride would be dressed in red. I travel a lot to Turkey. Every wedding that I've been to, the bride is dressed in white. And elsewhere, other parts of the world that I've gone to, the bride is dressed in a local color. And to me, that's a sign that Islam has found a local color in those cultures. The fact that we, read, we're, we wear red in the Indian subcontinent comes from the local cultures there. White comes from the local culture in Turkey. I don't feel that we found a local color for Islam in Britain as yet. Thank you very much. I think I we think, need to work on that. I just think very that's finally, a really beautiful note to end on. Just, just very finally, three words. Okay. Three words. Having said that, I think I need to say the reverse side of the coin. And, and to emphasize that, I do a lot of youth work. And there's three words that I keep on mentioning to the people that I work with. Firstly, critical. Secondly, Muslim. And thirdly, citizenship. I think we should emphasize all of those three things equally. Thank you very much. I, I realize it's been a very long day, so I just want to thank all of our panelists, the Nuhud scholars, for their fantastic contributions, all of our chairs, all of you in the audience for being here. And I really want to say, say a special shout out thank you to all the volunteers and Nia Melburney, who really has been the driving force behind this. And to say a final farewell and thank you, I would like to invite Professor Abdul Halim, and it's goodbye from me. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, thanks and praise to God. This has been, to me, a very successful conference. It exceeded all my expectations, really and truly. <clears throat> we had excellent speakers, as you have seen. We have very responsive and active audience, which made it all lively and interesting and refreshing. Now, all, the, we, all this would not have been possible without the Nuhud Foundation for Developments in Kuwait, Dr. Ali al zumayya and Dr. Fahd al zumayya The Nuhud Foundation have paid all, are paying all the costs for the conference. In fact, they have paid for everything in the integration project. 
including scholarship for these beautiful students here who have done very well and have been very eloquent, and also for the conference. I uh, should I thank them all. I thank the, I thank the Hood Foundation. And I also like to thank people who have worked hard for this conference. First of all is Naama, Naama Bani. Naama. She has, worked, she has worked harder and longer than anybody. And then, of course, Miriam, Miriam Francois. And then we have Hannah and a very active, beautiful and charming team like Heba and Sarah and many others. I tell you, I must also thank my wife. <laughs> really and truly, she has worked very hard for this conference before it started. And she kept saying to me, you haven't invited so-and-so. You have not, you should include so-and-so. A long, hard work for her. The difference is this, that Naama and Miriam and others are all paid by the Center of Islamic Studies, and my wife is not. <laughs> she has been, she is fully committed to two things. Number one is the protection of the environment, exceeds anybody's expectation. And recently, the integration and the whole projects of integration at SOAS. I thank you all, and good news for you that the Nuhud Foundation are going to carry this further, and you are all invited to next year's conference, which will be about the same time. Many thanks. Many thanks to you. The Nuhud Foundation, Dr. Ali Zumaya and Dr. Fahd Zumaya, and all our speakers and everybody. Alhamdulillah. Thank you.